Okay, friends, I'm having some fun here. Was uh, my granddad a target of the industrial military complex? Chapter three, the future of the ocean, 1971, Wolfgang Friedman. Yes, so many notes. It was openly critical of the Nixon administration's plan to carve up the ocean bed and sell exploration rights. Woo. The challenge, some basic concepts. Okay, ocean bed resources, a summary survey. The economic importance of ocean resources is in the, de in the decades to come in the decades to come is determined basically by two criteria. On the one hand, the kind of resources actually or potentially available for, for exploitation. On the other hand, their accessibility determined by such factors as the depth at which the resource occurs in exploitable quantities and the geological structure of the seabed wherein it is found. The importance of depth and geological structure is, of course, closely related to available methods of exploitation. If, for example, it is either technically impossible or economically pro pro prohibitive to drill for oil, natural gas or other minerals at a depth exceeding 50 metres, the occurrence of rich deposits at depths of 100 metres or 600 metres is of purely theoretical interest. Even during the 13 years that have elapsed since the Continental Shelf Con Convention of 1958, the technology of ocean bed exploration, seabed stations, ocean bed drilling, at ever increasing depth and transportation along ocean floors have advanced at such a dramatic rate that the importance of ocean bed resources has expanded dramatically. Ships now exist that can go up and down sideways and can flip. They can swim, fly and dive and they are able to navigate more precisely than ever before. These refinements coupled with the ability to examine the ocean bed in detail from the surface by means of television and side looking sonar have produced remarkable result, results. Consequently, the legal status of the ocean bed has become a matter of crucial importance. In the words of a famous French proverb, l'appétit vient en mangeant, appetite comes with eating. If a quarter of a century ago, control of the sea and subsoil resources of the continental shelf to a depth of 200 meters, seem more than adequate to, satis to satisfy the needs of the foreseeable future. Today, rights over the continental margin extending from 3,000 to 4,000 metres deep have become sufficiently desirable to be subject, to be the subject of expanding national claims and bitter legal controversy. <laughs> bitter legal controversy. Exploitable marine resources can be divided into three general categories. The first and only one that has been the subject of economic exploitation until very recently consists of fish and other free-moving organisms. The present ocean harvest was recently estimated at about 55 million metric tonnes per year, representing an income of approximately 8 billion. 90% of this consists of fin fish, the rest of whales, crustaceans and mollusks, as well as other invertebrates. Three quarters of this total harvest is taken by 14 countries. What is perhaps even more significant is the rate of increase in the ocean harvest. In the century from 1850, from 1850 to 1950, the world catch increased tenfold at an average rate of about 25% each decade. It doubled in the subsequent decade. Since 1938, the world's fish catch has more than tripled. The Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations has estimated the total 1968 catch of 64 million metric tons at about 11 12th, consisting of marine fishes. Of this total harvest, half is consumed by humans while the rest becomes livestock feed. The habits of such creatures as whales, salmon and eel are still largely unexplored, but obviously these animals, together with the other pelagic fishes, move across the ocean in total disregard of national boundaries, making crucial the question of the extent of the freedom of the oceans. I love that he's uh, saying that the fish, that the ocean belongs to the fish. Uh, 
together with freedom of navigation, unrestricted fishing, except for very narrow, narrow territorial waters, has been the most important aspect of the doctrine of the freedom of the seas. The growing tendency of states to extend their exclusive national fishery zones, in some cases as far as 200 miles from the coast, is one of the many grave encroachments upon this freedom. Second, there are organisms such as oysters which are either stationary or move within very limited distances and whose extraction has therefore been compared to a type of agricultural processing. Third, and of increasing importance are the offshore minerals of which oil and gas are by far the most important at the present time. Or oil and gas in the ocean bed, like off the coast of Brazil. Yeah? Yeah, they're doing deep sea drilling with robots. It was the rapidly expanding consumption of oil and gas coupled with growing, the growing feasibility of offshore drilling that led to the Truman Proclamation and created the rapid spread of claims for exclusive exploitation of the continental shelf throughout the world. The figures are certainly staggering. An, Ita an Italian expert has estimated that the world's consumption of oil, which increases at a rate of 1 billion. Oh la la. 1 billion barrels per year will have risen in 25 years to five times the present volume. At the end of 1968, proved oil reserves were estimated at more than 65 billion tonnes. The explosive exploration in the demand for oil and gas products account for the dramatic increase in offshore production. In 1966, offshore oil and gas production in the United States, which 10 years earlier represented 1% of the total, had risen to 10% and by 1969 to 15%. Wall Street Journal, September 30th, 1969. On a worldwide basis, offshore oil production in 1966 was 6 million barrels per day, roughly 15% of the total production. Offshore oil reserves have recently been estimated as 20% of the world's total reserves. New York Times, February 12th, 1967. While the rate of progress in offshore exploitation of oil and gas will depend on a number of variables and constantly shifting equations between the relative merits of urgency, economic efficiency, political stability, legal security and other relevant factors, pressure for expanding oil production is certain to lead to a continuing expansion of this form of mining. All depends on the oil price. Right now, yes. Compared with oil and gas nat and natural gas, the present value of other seabed minerals is at this time relatively minor, except for sulphur, which is already mined in considerable quantities from the subsea off the coast of Louisiana. In his historical, historic memorandum of August 1967 to the First Committee of the United Nations General Assembly, Ambassador Arvid Pardo of Malta gave a survey of the mineral resources of the seabed. He observed that the no nodules, no nodules, which are the principal form of seabed surface deposits, deposit contain the following. The following. 43 billion tons of aluminium, equivalent to, to reserves for 20,000 years at the 1960 world rate of consumption, as compared to known land reserves for a hundred years. 350 million tonnes of manganese, equivalent to reserves for 400,000 years as compared to known land reserves of only a hundred years. 7.9 billion tonnes of copper, equivalent to reserves for 6,000 years as compared to only 40 years for land. Nearly 1 billion tonnes of zirconium, equivalent to reserves for 100,000 years as compared to a hundred years on land. 14.7 billion tonnes of nickel, equivalent to reserves for 150,000 years as compared to 100 years on land. 5.2 billion tonnes of co cobalt, co cobalt, equivalent to reserves for 200,000 years as compared to land reserves for 40 years only. Three quarters of a billion tonnes of molybdenum, moly, molybdenum, molybdenum equivalent to reserves for 30,000 years as compared to 500 years on land. In addition, the Pacific Ocean no nodules, 
contained two, 207 billion tonnes of iron, nearly 10 billion tonnes of titanium, 25 billion tonnes of magnesium, 1.3 billion tonnes of lead, 800 million tonnes of vanadium, and, and so on. But many of these va valuable minerals are in the deeper reaches of the ocean bed, so dispersed so dispersed that their economic exploitation is not practical in the foreseeable future. To give just one example, it has been estimated that there are 5 million tonnes of gold in the oceans, which would represent 5 trillion at current prices, in theory a staggering value, but the cost of exploitation would be so great that this potential source of wealth is purely theoretical, and a leading metallurgist and former vice president of the International Nickel Company has observed that current activity in the recovery of metals from deep ocean bed no nodules, particularly manganese, is essentially exploratory and speculative, with no likelihood of any exploitation of deep ocean nodules on a commercial scale before 1985. And this was written in 1971. So, 1985. Other ex Estimates appear to concur that commercial development of deep sea minerals is not, not likely to be significant for many years to come. After a development becomes significant, it will still be many years before royalty or rental payments will become large. In an estimate of the profitability of deep sea manganese exploitation, the most important of the mineral nodules, um, so this was made in 1969 by the Commission on Marine Sciences, engineering and resources, the conclusion was that even on the most favourable technological assumptions, the return on capital invested in deep sea manganese exploitation at best would be marginal. But this may not necessarily apply to all regions of the ocean. Thus, the leading study on the subject has estimated the average concentration of nickel nodules for the whole Pacific at 0.35%, but samples taken from the tip of Baja California have shown nickel content of 1.19% to 1.46%. 1 Considering the fantastic rate of technological progress in ocean bed technology, deep sea mineral activity and the legal structure of the ocean bed may well become a matter of increasing importance. The economic consequences of exploiting such minerals as copper or nickel in marketable quantities from nodule concentration is potentially formidable. By making certain relative scarce materials. By making certain relatively scarce materials abundant, it could completely upset the international commodities market. This in turn could deeply affect the attitude of certain major producers like Chile and to a lesser extent Peru, which would have an economic interest in preventing exploitation of copper from the ocean bed. Both countries have led Latin American claims to a 200 mile territorial, territorial water zone in which they could hinder exploitation and in the deep seas beyond national jurisdiction they would certainly do everything in their power to prevent exploitation of such resources under the aegis of an international seabed authority. The mere possibility of future exploitation of these riches is already influencing the legal attitudes of different states. However, in the foreseeable future, the continental shelf proper, and to a lesser but increasingly important extent, the wider continental margin, will absorb the greatest part of each nation's offshore activities, since 90% of the world's marine food resources, now extracted at the rate of 8 billion per year, and nearly a fifth of the total world production of petroleum and natural gas, representing a value of about 4 billion, come from the continental shelves. At the present time, the deepest offshore production operation is at depth is at a depth of 103 meters in the Gulf of Mexico. This is well within the universally recognized minimum depth of the continental shelf, which is 183 meters, but the rate of expansion in depth exploration is extraordinary. As Stuart and Pontecorvo have observed, although it required nearly 25 years for oil companies to move from 15 metres to the 195 metre level of exploratory drillings, only one year later experimental drillings had gone to 366 metres. Yeah, I think they're already at a couple of kilometres, I need to check that. Some believe that there will be drilling at 2,000 metres by the late 70s. 
There is, however, a wide gap between exploration and exploitation. The cost of oil exploitation is staggering and requires investments of which only major states or giant corporations or consortia are capable. According to the Wall Street Journal on September 30th, 1969, the cost of drilling 12,500 holes under United States water and bringing the commercially profitable borings into production was about 13 billion, including rental and royalty payments and the costs are constantly going up. It remains to say a few words about the prevailing techniques of offshore drilling for these, like the economics of the matter, have a profound impact on the political and legal future of the oceans. Oh, long, long, long sentences with lots of commas. At present, the most predominant method of exploiting offshore fields is from the fixed platform supported by piles fixed in the seabed. Wells are drilled into the, into the ocean floor through conductor pipes and oil or gas is pumped through a sea line from the platform to the shore. But although it is still feasible to install fixed platforms and connecting sea lines up to the depth of 200 metres, the minimum limit of the continental shelf, the installation of such platforms will become increasingly uneconomical as operations proceed to greater depth. While the precise limits of economic rentability for the fixed platform are still under discussion, the experts foresee the increasing importance of alternatives to drilling from fixed structures. One alternative is the floating unit, which may be a drilling vessel or a semi-submersible platform. Floating vessels are specially built and self-propelled ships move from one spot to another supporting the drilling rig. Semi-submersible platforms are structures made of large columns buoyed underneath by caissons, with decks above on which drilling rigs, living quarters and equipment are installed. These floating platforms are towed to different areas of exploitation where they are partially sunk and moored. Another important development is the underwater well for which the wellhead is actually located on the seabed. Several types of underwater wellheads have already been installed in depth of up to, up to 100 metres and it is anticipated that before long it will be possible to control them remotely with acoustic signals, completely doing away with the intervention of divers. All this goes together with rapid progress in, water, in underwater transportation and the possibility of stationing human beings on the ocean floor for prolonged periods. Jackie Cousteau and Albert Picard are among the pioneers in developing different forms of submersibles that can be used to explore the deep seas and the seabeds. Among the most famous experiments are the American Sea Lab Project laboratories, in which teams of 10 men lived in steel chambers for 45 days. Costo's successful attempt in 1965 to have a team of six ocean noughts live for 23 days in a chamber from which they dived to depth of 100 metres to 120 metres without support from a surface vessel, and the Soviet experiment in the Black Sea where scientists spent 10 days in a laboratory 57 feet below the surface. We may now sum up this very cursory survey of the astounding technological developments of the last decade. First, the economic pressure from the exploitation of oil and gas at ever increasing depth, principally concentrated in the, in the continental shelves, is an inevitable consequence of the constant acceleration in mankind's demand, demand for oil and gas and other vital minerals. Second, technological progress makes full exploitation of the resources of the continental shelf proper and more selective exploitation of mineral resources in the continental margin beyond the shelf a practical prospect within the next decade. The exploration and exploitation of the seabed resources of the ocean bed beyond the continental margin remain a more distant prospect. Third, there has been a mo amazing progress in man's ability to spend prolonged periods on or near the bottom of the ocean at depths well exceeding the limits of the continental shelf proper. The variety of technological devices for the exploration of offshore resources is constantly increasing and will result for one thing in the gradual replacement of the presently prevailing fixed platform on the surface of the water by floating platforms, drilling vessels, submerged installations and transportation devices along the bottom of the sea. Oh, all right, shall I just carry on? How? how? Finish the chapter, finish the chapter.
ocean bed mining and its effects on our navigation and fishing. The steady horizontal and vertical extension of mining operations with the multiplication of fixed and floating platforms, drilling vessels, submerged platforms, submarine stations, maintenance services and diving equipment, feeder lines, offshore storage and loading facilities will increasingly curtail two of the most vital areas of the freedom of the seas, navigation and fishing. In the Gulf of Mexico, one of the most closely mined offshore areas, oil rigs, oil rigs have become so numerous that it has been necessary to provide fair lines for shipping. In spite of the safety precautions, warning signals and markers that may be installed on the high seas and the continental shelf in accordance with the Geneva Convention, which purports to safeguard the freedom of, of shipping and fishing, these traditional freedoms will soon be converted from primary rights into secondary licenses by the escalation of mining operations. Ships will be forced to pick their way through the water above the continental shelf as they used to with the aid of local pilots through dangerous straits and uncharted local waters. The plight of fishing is perhaps even more obvious. The effect of mining, drilling and trawling in the continental margin have been summed up by Dr. Sidney J. Holt of the Food and Agricultural Organization. First, the seabed, seabed may become locally polluted with solid spoil, which will change the quantity and quality of seabed life, thus indirectly affecting the animals that feed on it. Secondly, the more important oil spillages, such as those which provoked the recent disasters of, off Santa Barbara and the coast of Nova Scotia, are bound to occur with increasing frequency in proportion to the multiplication of oil drillings, affecting the lives or organisms of the sea and their food supplies. Third, pollution at the surface, the result of spillage from oil tankers and leakers in oil rig can be transferred to the seabed by the sinking of the oil masses. Fourth, the physical disturbances caused by fish may affect the whole seabed. Fifthly, installations such as cables and pipelines can interfere with trawling and vice versa. In addition to the disturbances caused by expanding mining operations in the sea, there is another and older danger to the living resources of the ocean, overfishing by a trawler fleet like those of the Soviet Union, Japan and Norway, which includes fish processing ships and apply increasingly mechanised and indiscriminate methods of fishing. This kind of unregulated and mechanised competition has already led to the virtual extinction of many species of whales and the rapid dwindling of such sea staples as California sardines. Northwest Pacific salmon and barren sea cod. It is the result of lack of adequate internationally agreed conservation measures of the ruthless application of modern technology to an ancient occupation that did not and could not disturb the ecology of marine life as it was practiced over the ages. One conclusion emerges clearly from all that has been said as the world population swells at an exponential rate from the present 3.5 billion to what will be more than double that number by the end of the century. Accompanied by progressive industrialization and me mechanization of production, there will be a proportionate increase in the demand for the enormous food and mineral resources contained in the ocean bed. Gradually, the seas will be farmed, mined and exploited like the land let us not be taken unawares in this, in this still relatively virgin area as we were in the unregulated development of land for which we are now painfully suffering the consequences. I love that he gets his opinion in about what he thinks because now I know that he is definitely anti-laissez-faire, anti-laissez-faire. So let me just repeat that. Gradually, the seas will be farmed, mined and exploited like the land. Let us not be taken unawares in this still relatively virgin area as we were in the unregulated development of the land, for which we are now painfully suffering the consequences. There is no alternative to conscious and planned regulation of life on the seas, the surface as well as on the ocean bed. The basic choice facing mankind is whether exploitation will will occur by a ruthless partitioning between competing nations or whether the increasing importance, important resources of the sea will be considered in the formulation first referred to by President Johnson in 1966 as the common heritage of mankind. 
The choice is a political one, but it will express itself in the legal status and regime of the oceans. It is to these legal alternatives that we will now turn. Done. <laughs>